Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Vows's fifth Zoom webinar. My name is Patrick Oswald, and I will be the moderator for today's, today's session. Thank you all for braving the heat to join us tonight. Vauza wishes to acknowledge that when we swim in the waters off the Vancouver area beaches, we do so in the traditional unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. This webinar will be recorded and available on the Vauza website for anyone not able to join us tonight. Our thanks go out to those of you who have already submitted questions for our presenters. Your microphones will be muted during the presentations, but you can still use chat if you have any additional questions and uh, we will do our best to get answers uh, to them if time permits. And if not, then hopefully our presenters will be able to provide some answers that we can post on the website at a later date. Before we get started, VAUSA President Craig Stewart will say a few words. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's really nice out today, nicer than yesterday, and then it's a little bit cooler. Last night, VAUSA had its first practice swim of 2021. Uh, it felt fantastic to be back doing it where we normally do it at Kitts Beach, uh, very close where I am near Granville Island. And uh, the next one will be happening on Monday and we're gonna do an online registration. The announcement today from the BC government also suggests that that's gonna be an unlimited number. We've kept it at 50, but now it seems like we can go to uh, as many as will come out on a nice uh, evening to for a swim in the ocean. Now, one of the questions people often have is like, do I have to be a really good swimmer? No, you have to be brave enough to get into the ocean, the dark water. Um, and we, on the website, it sort of says, if you can swim a thousand meters without interruption in a pool, you're fine. Uh, and what I usually say to anybody who's new coming to Valza practice swim is, um, first I ask if they have any questions. And the most common one is, can I just come out early? Of course you can, as long as you're not swimming back into the swimmer. So basically you can come in, do a 500 meters, 25 meters and come right back out. There is no uh, bar because the mandate of vows is to have everybody be comfortable with open water swimming. And some people that takes a little bit. Um, certainly my first time was awful and then I got used to it. So yes, I want anyone to come and to feel welcome. And if there's anything interrupting that, I wanna know about it. How can we make it better? Thanks for joining tonight. Uh, I hope it's gonna be uh, illuminating and instructive and I look forward to it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Craig. Um, our, uh, our first presenter tonight is uh, Yanka Corwin. Yanka has been teaching and coaching swimming for over 45 years. She is an expert on stroke mechanics with skills honed from her competitive background and years of teaching. She's passionate about swimming and loves to work with swimmers at all levels. She was a national age group record holder and has represented Canada at a number of international swim competitions, both in the United States and Europe. Yanka is also a sessional instructor at the University of British Columbia's School of Kinesiology. She's a fitness instructor and a personal trainer. Yanka, over to you. Thank you. And again, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Um, yes, it's still pretty warm out there. The pool behind me, for those of you that don't recognize it, it's the Kitsilano Swimming Pool. Um, it is by Kitts Beach. Uh, it's 150 yards or 137 and a half meters long. And this morning was the first swim that we had there um, with the Fast Lane Swim Group, which is a group that I currently coach. Um, so that's my current involvement. So I'm gonna get started. I've got some slides that we're gonna look at. Uh, and I'm just gonna answer some of the questions that were posed by uh, many of you. Um, and here we go. So. Um, All right, so we're gonna talk about um, some open water swimming tips. So here are the questions that I'm going to try endeavor to answer. I've got some information um, and as was earlier said, um, this information will be available because it will be videoed, uh, it'll be recorded and you will be able to look at some of the stuff if you would like to go back and review it. Okay. So how to begin? Um, oh, where to start? Uh, so the first thing that I 
recommend is that if you are thinking about um, doing open water swimming and you haven't sort of done a lot yet, then you want to become a relatively strong swimmer in the pool first. You want to feel comfortable in the pool. And I will go through a few ideas on how to get comfortable and how to increase your distance uh, and your endurance before you want to go in the water expect when you are in the open water that, it, that you may run into fish, maybe even some slimy, slimy vegetation, um, insects, or maybe even a seal or two that may want to come and join you. So be aware of that as well as other things that I think Gila is going to talk about. You always want to swim with a buddy or a group and try to swim with, where, in a lifeguarded area whenever possible. You do want to get yourself a swim boy, which is that little thing that's the swimming below is towing. And you want to have a plan and a backup plan. Um, know the conditions. You want to swim close to the shore uh, whenever possible. And a couple of uh, safety devices, a peeless whistle, which is a whistle that doesn't have a little pee inside of it. So if it gets wet, um, you can still blow it, um, as well as uh, carry a, wa a water resistant cell phone or one that's in a package, maybe in your swim boy in case you need to uh, phone for help. You want to get yourself a good wetsuit uh, for specifically for open water swimming if you haven't already done so. It'll keep you warm. And the other thing that it does is it floats. It helps you float a little bit better. So again, something that may help when you are out there being tossed around in the, uh, in the ocean. Uh, before you actually use your wetsuit out in the, uh, in the ocean, you do want to, or open water, you do want to try it out in a pool and make sure that you feel comfortable with it because it's going to feel different. Your stroke is definitely going to feel different. Be aware that the temperature of the water will vary and therefore, if it's cold, you're going to have muscles that may get tight. Uh, your breathing may be erratic and shallow. And so you definitely want to make sure that you have good equipment. And I've got a couple of pieces of equipment examples there. You, you want to have that wetsuit, a really good pair of goggles that are going to feel comfortable <clears throat> for extended period of time, a bathing cap or even two. And if it's warmer, then you may want to use something a little lighter like that triathlon suit there that still gives you some buoyancy, but does doesn't cover all of the limbs if the water is a little warmer. So I'm getting used to cold water, which is definitely one of the things that uh, you need to be aware of. So climatize, take cold showers, take cold baths. Um, there's some uh, temperatures there for you to review. Um, if the water temperature is below 50 uh, or 10 degrees Celsius, then you not really suitable to be swimming in open water. And I appreciate that some people swim all year long, um, but you're definitely, I wanna make sure that you are a seasoned swimmer if you're gonna go out there um, in that cooler water. And as you can see, um, I have it in increments there of uh, recommendations for wearing a wetsuit all the way up to not wearing a wetsuit depending on how warm the water is. Uh, you want to work when you are in the swimming pool, you want to work on changing direction uh, without using a wall or pushing off the bottom because that sometimes can be challenging as you are out there in the ocean, there isn't a wall to push off of. Um, you also want to work on rolling over onto your back. Um, it's really important that you are able to get onto your back and if you need to do any equipment changing or equipment fixing um, or if you just need to take a little break. Because the last thing you want to do is, um, is lift your head up because then your legs sink and it becomes a little bit more difficult to get back into that layout position that you need to be in when you're swimming. So you just want to sort of think about rolling over. Sighting, um, a big one, obviously, uh, when you're out in open water, you want to sort of know where you're going because you can't see where you're going. Uh, and uh, so you want to Work on sighting when you are in the pool, pick a spot out in front of you or somewhere on the wall and you want to look for it a couple of times possibly to make sure that you can actually see it. And there's one thing that's really important that you practice sighting and breathing as two separate entities. As you can see there in the bottom, I have a little picture um, with the swimmer um, just lifting her eyes up out of the water. So her nose and mouth are in the water and that's the sighting position. And then the breathing position is again in that side position. So you wanna avoid doing both at the same time because 
because again, your legs may sink and it becomes a little bit more difficult to get back into that good layout position in your swimming. And siding should be done um, you know, up to three times to look for whatever it is you need to do and then go back to doing about 10 to 15 strokes. But it really depends on the conditions and it depends on where you happen to be if you need to make a directional change. So you may need to sight a little bit more often then. Uh, got this thing in the way. There we go. Another thing you want to work on is different length strokes. So if the water's choppy, you're going to probably do a shorter, shallower stroke. If the water is nice and smooth, then you want to work on a nice, long, smooth stroke. So it really depends on the water conditions. Of course, open water races are a really great way to practice. So what you want to do, work, out, work up to um, your length and races range anywhere from one kilometer to 25 and even more. I know that there's definitely more um, uh, longer swims out there. But before you're wanting to get out there and actually swim a kilometer, you want to make sure that you can swim at least two times that distance in the pool. So if you're going to swim a kilometer, you want to be able to swim two kilometers in the pool so that you feel comfortable before you get out into the ocean because it's not the same. Um, open water distances typically are elongated due to the different conditions that you may be going into. So an example, a 30 minute swim in a pool could wind up being up to 55 minutes if you're being tossed around in the waves and maybe even moved around by the different currents that happen to be out in the ocean or any open water environment. One of the important things is that you're comfortable breathing on both sides, what we call bilateral breathing. So breathing every three strokes. Because one, one of the things that can happen is you're out there in the, in the open water and there are, there's wind, there's waves, there's currents. And if you have a dominant breathing side, we all have a dominant breathing side. But if you're only really comfortable breathing on that dominant breathing side, it could make swimming impossible if the conditions are just right to be not in your favor. So work on bilateral breathing as much as you can in training so that when you actually get out there into the open water, um, then you can choose the side that's going to work best for the conditions. Um, a little example there on how to work on your bilateral breathing. Uh, and you should be comfortable with varied breathing patterns because again, sometimes the conditions are such that you don't always get a regular breathing pattern in because the water is wavy and or windy. One of the other things that you want to work on is not always just front crawl. Um, work on some basics, include some drills in your, especially in your warm up. Here I've given you uh, four different types of drills. Single arm um, would be one of them. So both hands are in front of you and you just swim with one arm. And then you alternate sides. And it's a really good way to work on breathing on both sides. Catch up where you're alternating single arms. So single arm um, left, touch, and then single arm right and touch. And the touch would be out in front of you. Um, zipper or fingertip drag, exactly what it says. Basically, you're dragging your fingertips along the surface of the water. And this works on your rolling and high elbows. And another really good one is stroke count, where you're counting the number of strokes that it takes you. And you're looking for stroke efficiency, goal somewhere between 17 and 20 strokes per 25 meters, obviously in a pool situation. Avoid swimming with a pole boy too much. I know that for many of us, uh, swimming with a pole boy does make it easier, but it's like running without your arms. You do need your kick for balance, rhythm, and support. So you do want to make sure that you do practice swimming with your legs as well. And every so often, throw some other strokes in there. Cross training in the pool, therefore doing back crawl, breaststroke, side stroke, elementary backstroke, or whatever you have is a really good way to improve your front crawl. But also, it helps with uh, reducing any overuse injuries uh, when you start to increase your distance. So how to build endurance. Um, First of all, work on maintaining a nice, smooth, long stroke that would come out of that, um, that stroke count, you know, where the stroke is nice and long and extended. And then start putting some different uh, lengths and different varieties into your workout to start building your endurance. So, for example, I have, an, uh, I have here uh, 
a couple of different ways to build up to that kilometer nonstop. So after you've had a warm up, you can then break your distance down into shorter segments, um, having a little rest in there, and then do that three or four times before you increase the distance. And as you can see, your the distance increases, but the number of repetitions decreases, obviously, as you're moving towards your thousand meter steady nonstop. And then the next one would then be to work up to 2000 meters. Uh, so 1.5 to two kilometers. And again, you're increasing your distance, you're decreasing the repetitions, you're doing that three to five times until you sort of up to that 2000 meters. And when you've completed 2000 in the me meters in the pool comfortably, then you're ready for that first 1000 meters in the open water. When you are swimming in the open water, especially just starting off, you want to swim parallel to the shore, maybe even staying shallow enough that you can stand on the bottom. Um, so maybe the water is four and a half feet if you're not going to hit the bottom, but it definitely gives you an opportunity if you start to get Dis, uh, disoriented, um, then you have the option of standing up and sort of reconfiguring or maybe re repositioning your goggles, putting on your bathing cap again or whatever it is. The beautiful thing about being in the water is it's extremely forgiving on, on your joints. And so working up and swimming longer and further um, is, is a lot easier than impact activities such as running. So even as we get older, swimming can be something that you can continue to improve upon and continue to increase your distance. So that was how to get started. Um, so the second point was how to power through a current. Uh, and this is sometimes, this is one of the biggest dangers in open water swimming is figuring out the currents and, uh, and they can affect you regardless of your swimming ability. So what you wanna do is you wanna plan ahead. You wanna know the tides and then you wanna also know the weather. And so swim out against the current or against the tide and then swim in with the tide. That way, when you're fresh, you can um, work a little harder. And then on your way back, when you're swimming with the tide, you can ease up a little bit and, um, and catch your breath. Um, be aware that there could be different things that are out in the water and that can affect the current. So maybe having a chat with people who do swim in the area or know the area or lifeguards, they can sort of let you know what's out there so that you can keep yourself safe. If you get caught in a current, and there I have two pictures, definitely a very different swim. The top swim, choppy, um, you could definitely have a current in there um, that's going to affect the side that you breathe on compared to that beautiful tranquil swim in the picture below. So if you do get caught in a current, you want to not fight it. That's the first thing. And I know our automatic response is, oh, my goodness, I got to fight this. Stay calm figure out the direction that the current is taking you in and then try to find a 90 degree angle and to ease the flow and move yourself towards shore um, the best that you can. The next one. Um, so the next question that I had was when do I, when I, um, when you get pins and needles in your arms, is that normal? Um, yes. <laughs> um, it can be. So what is pins and needles? It is the recovery of a limb after there's been some numbness. So don't necessarily feel the numbness, but we definitely feel that tingling sensation once the limb is recovering from numbness. And what are, what are some of the causes? Cold water can definitely affect blood flow. Um, Wetsuits that are a little too tight, maybe around the arms and or the shoulders may cut off circulation. That can affect and give you some tingling. So again, be aware of that. There are other conditions that that may also affect like tennis elbow, uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, and maybe even some medications. So if you're experiencing those things, just maybe connect with your doctor and make sure that there isn't something that is underlying. Um, finally, and probably most important is stroke mechanics. Uh, resulting usually from fatigue and incorrect pressure on the joint can cause, again, some blood flow issues. So you definitely want to have that stroke the best that it can be when you are doing longer um, swims. Um, I stole this from my chiropractor. Um, I saw that on the wall and I thought, huh, this is really interesting. So it shows you if you have some 
impingement a little bit or some uh, areas of your neck that are maybe needing a little bit of support and how they affect the arm. And so, for example, if you've got pins and needles and or numbing uh, around the thumb and index finger that's coming from your cervical, cervical six area, if it's in your middle finger, it's your C7, if it's in your pinky and your ring finger, C8. So again, just something to be aware of and maybe have that checked if it's an area that seems to um, have pins and needles regularly. That brings us to number four, and that's how to avoid swimming related injuries. And there definitely are some, especially in the shoulders and the neck. And it comes back to stroke mechanics. Um, as long as the stroke is done correctly, um, you should be able to reduce injuries to the shoulder and neck area. The first thing you wanna do is make sure you warm up really well. And it takes anywhere from 10 to 12 minutes to actually be warmed up. So during that time, it's great to do some drills, maybe um, do some different strokes before you start actually getting into uh, your swim, especially as we get older, that synovial fluid needs to get warmed up so that it's flowing in that joint. And therefore you wouldn't be doing any um, unnecessary strain on the joint. So you wanna make sure that you do a good warm up. Um, you want to train quality strokes. You want to stay focused on your strokes because when you start to build your mileage, sometimes it's the, uh, it's the mileage that can affect um, the stroke because sometimes we don't we're not necessarily doing the best stroke possible. Great things that you can do. You can have your stroke videotaped and review it. Have a look at it. Nowadays, the technology is so easy. We can look above, we can look below. Grab someone to, to videotape you and you can have a view. Take a lesson or two every so often. Make sure that your stroke is good, especially if you start to feel a little bit uncomfortable and you're starting to um, feel some um, discomfort, especially in that neck and shoulder area. Um, shoulder limber stretches at the end of your set are really important. And I have a really cute little uh, picture here on some good shoulder stretches that you could do on the side of the pool or maybe in the shower um, after you get out of the water once the shower is open in the swimming pools. Um, and I've circled this one right here. Um, so the second one sort of the small one on the left-hand side. I believe that that's probably one of, one of the most important sh uh, stretches to do. It stretches out the underneath part of your arm, which pulls on the top part of your shoulder. So if you're experiencing a little bit of discomfort, especially on the front of your shoulder, then do take some time to stretch out that under a part of your um, arm. So stretching out that tricep uh, as well as moving into the lats. So there's some stretches, many of them out there in the, um, in the interwaves, you can definitely look them up and um, hopefully get some relief um, if you are finding that your shoulders get stiff. Cramps is another question that was brought up. Um, so what happens when you get a cramp? So again, it's a, what is it? It's a, the muscle, a cramp is a sudden and involuntary contraction of one or more muscles. And it sometimes happens in your feet and sometimes happens in your calves. And this can last for a few seconds or maybe even a few minutes. And that can be very disconcerting when you're out there in the open water. Um, so at that particular point, um, you definitely want to uh, take a moment, um, let the blood start flowing back into that area. Um, you may wanna roll over onto your back, rest. It's your body's way of saying, stop, rest, it's too much. Usually that's what a cramp is. Let's look at some of the other things. Um, again, it could be medication. It could be strain and overuse. Um, it could even have something to do with nerves. If the water is too cold, it's another reason why you get cramps. But one of the most common ones is pointing your toes while kicking. You want to have floppy feet and you want to have that kick going from your hip. Um, and so you don't want to think about kicking with your feet. You want to kick with the whole leg. And that will, in many cases, help with uh, if you're getting cramps regularly in your toes or in your calf. Dehydration and muscle fatigue would be other two that you do need to sort of check and make sure that those aren't um, factors. Uh, so again, you wanna lengthen your stroke, slow down, roll over onto your back and take a break. We sort of reassess the situation before you carry on. 
So again, if you do get that cramp in your foot or in your um, calf and you are offshore, um, the best thing to do is roll over onto your back until the cramp eases and then sort of get into a semi-sitting position and try to massage the area. You could point and flex the toes a little bit, but just be careful with that one because sometimes that can re uh, recramp the foot. So again, gently pointing and flexing and maybe massaging the area can definitely help. And then just wait, allow your body to take that moment, uh, figure out where you are and make a decision on what you want to do, sort of whether or not you want to swim further or you maybe you want to head back. Because remember, it is your body's way of saying, stop, take a moment. So the next question that was brought up that I thought that I would just touch on would be was to diet for endurance and performance. So first and foremost, as everything, you want a solid nutritional uh, foundation. You want to make sure that you consume adequate calories in the form of macronutrients that are a combination of fruits and vegetables, of carbs, of proteins, etc. Remembering that good fuel also keeps you warm in a cooler, cold environment. Um, if you actually aren't, if you run out of fuel, if you run out of calories, you wind up getting colder faster and it may lead to cramps. So be aware of that as well. So, um, so the next one was um, looking at guidance on uh, eating during longer swims, five hours or more. So again, it is definitely about stacking, making sure that you fuel yourself really, really well leading up to that longer swim. Um, sort of thinking three to four hours out, you want to have a complete meal with at least three food groups and hydrate. An hour before you want to eat a fast digestive carb, avoid high fiber, just in case because that can make you uh, your stomach cramp and that's just not a good feeling to have out there when you're swimming for an extended period of time. Mm -hmm. And then again, a little bit uh, closer to the actual swim again some carbs and hydrate hydrate hydrate. When you are hydrating you definitely don't want to drink the whole bottle all at once you want to break it down into little bits so that your body can actually absorb it. Thinking a little bit about when um, if you are swimming over 90 minutes, then the suggestion is, as you are um, reloading your carbs, um, about every 20 to 30 minutes after the first hour. And uh, so that's quite important that you do keep something that is going to uh, uh, fill that fuel tank. Um, fruit, fruit that's easy to eat, things that are easy to eat, like canned peaches, bananas, those sorts of things that don't get stuck in your teeth and definitely give you the energy that you need. After about three hours, you also want to consider some protein in addition to the carbs, because at that particular point, you're now starting to definitely run out. That fuel tank is getting low. Also think about the fact that when we are in certain water temperatures that we start to sweat and we are sweating, it is suggested that we can sweat one to three liters per hour, again, depending on the environment that you're in. So you do want to consider some electrolytes. And if you happen to be an individual that um, you, loses a lot of sodium, and that's really individual, you and there, it, and that's something that you would have to figure out if you're sweating salty or your eye sting or your wound stings, you know that you're a little bit saltier, a little bit more sodium. So you definitely want to include some sodium in your electrolytes. Usually electrolytes don't have a lot of sodium, um, the good type of electrolytes. So again, just be aware of the type of sweater <laughs> that you are. Okay. Um, after the swim, after a long swim like that, you do want to also continue replenishing, continue to replenish, if, replenish 24 to 48 hours, also hydrate well. Some of the common mistakes are not eating enough, not eating enough carbs and not hydrating enough. So again, it's something that you need to figure out what works best for you. Um, you can't copy other people's regime. It can be a starting point, but be aware that your body is unique to you. The way that you expend energy and how hard you are working is going to be unique to you. So figure out what works best for you. And, um, and it is a process. Um, you will feel better on certain things than others and make a note in your diary so that you can then start to weed out the things that don't work for you that well. 
last but not least, um, have um, some tips on getting over fear of water in the dark or dark water desensitize, desensitize, desensitize. It's like, it's one of those things where you just have to get out there and do it. And as you do it more and more often, you will become more and more comfortable. You wanna build up slowly, um, swim with others, join a group, um, swim parallel to the shore and stay shallow so that if you get a little overwhelmed by that dark water, you can stand up and return to land. Thank you very much. I hope that answered your questions. Um, Thank you. And that's all I have. Wow. Thank you very, very much. And you know what? I'm so glad that this is being recorded because I think people are going to want to circle back. You, you provided a mountain of information there. Really yeah. interesting. Thank you so much. Thank that you. Was excellent. That was excellent. And again, people, if you couldn't uh, take notes fast enough, you can circle back and, and uh, this will be recorded and, and on, the, on the website again. Excellent. Thank you. Excellent. All Thank right. you very much. Yeah. Well, um, our next presenter is Gila Muir from Seattle. Uh, now, Gila styles herself as an adult onset swimmer since she only took her first swim lesson at the grand old age of 46. But within just a few years, she found herself swimming the 11 miles, and that's miles, not kilometers, Portland Bridges swim. She swum Alcatraz more than 10 times, and she swims skin, which means no wetsuit, uh, all year round in Lake Washington and Puget Sound. To top things off, in February 2020, she won her 50 meter event at the International Winter Swimming Association's World Cup event in Sweden, where a 25 meter pool was cut out of the ice uh, of, a, of a frozen river. The exposed water was apparently 28 degrees cel uh, Fahrenheit uh, or minus 2.2 degrees Celsius, which is, so that was an incredible feat. But Gil is here today because she's a lot to say about swimming as we all get older. She started a Facebook page for swimmers who are over 60, and she's going to share with us tonight some of her many thoughts and ideas about open water swimming as we age. Gil? Hey, Patrick, thank you so much. I was really <laughs> looking forward to seeing uh, what you'd say in your introduction. Thanks for such a wonderful introduction. So folks, I imagine you're on this call either because you are a swimmer over 60 years of age, or you love a swimmer over 60 years of age, or you plan on being a swimmer over 60 years of age. This is for you. Uh, I'm gonna start sharing my screen here. Um, I think that uh, Patrick has covered uh, a lot of um, who I am. Um, just want to say that swimming, uh, starting as an adult onset swimmer, um, I, I'm not a particularly organic swimmer uh, like you folks who started as kids. Uh, maybe it's for that reason that I found so much joy when I finally started swimming open water, which is only two or three years after I learned how to swim. And I started a business called Say Yes to Life Swims because it's all about saying yes to life. I think all of us who swim in the open water uh, can agree on that. Uh, and I modeled this business on the swim trek model. Uh, we take people out not only for um, actual swims. You can see Mount Rainier in the background here. This is in Seattle, Washington. On Saturday, just last Saturday, oh, actually it was Sunday, uh, we do a 5K um, swim. Um, with my swim event business, the Say Yes to Life Swims. Uh, we give these events. I um, also give, um, they're kind of gourmet uh, situations where we find an alpine lake and, um, and then have a catered gourmet meal. Because if you're like me, I like eating just as much as I like swimming and swimming allows me to eat. So, hey, anytime there's a lot of food on a swim, I'm super happy. Um, Say Yes to Life Swims also, um, I have 50 individual swim students right now, which really keeps me busy in the open water. These are all open water swim lessons. Not everybody's over 60 that I deal with. I am over 60 and that's what made me start um, getting really interested in what is it like to be an older swimmer? I'm gonna put some stuff in chat 
they're basically links for you. I think Vowsa is going to make these available for you as well. And just as Yanka did such a great job answering the questions that um, folks gave initially, um, I'm going to suggest that people not only explore the Say Yes to Life swim site in case you want to come down and swim with us sometime, but also go to the virtual, virtual open water swim clinic. All your questions will be answered there. It's on YouTube, uh, equipment, uh, training, all that sort of stuff. So um, that should answer a lot of the questions that you gave us uh, that potentially weren't answered or that you want reinforced from what uh, Yanka said earlier. What I really wanna talk about is the joy of swimming as an older person. And Yanka kind of related to this, that um, it, it, swimming for older people is the perfect exercise because it, there's no jarring, um, there's no pounding, it helps stretch the muscles, strengthen the muscles. Open water swimming in particular improves circulation. And I've always known anecdotally and heard from many other people anecdotally that open water swimming helps combat depression. It's a great mental health pill. And now they're starting actually to get scientific studies that are at least examining this so that we can get true evidence-based research on um, what cold water swimming or open water swimming, uh, what effects it has on depression. So it's a perfect exercise. Um, I just wanted to show you this uh, group of friends. One of them's on the, uh, on the call right now. I created, a, uh, besides my business, which by the way, we're celebrating our 10th year of operation in the swim event business uh, this year. Woohoo! taking people out and having fun and uh, giving people swim lessons. This a group of friends and I uh, created Zogs, Z-O-G-S, standing for Zesty Older, I think I said E, Z-O-G-S, <clears throat> Zesty Older Gals Swimming. And recently we've had a couple of guys join us. So we're now Zesty Older Guys and Gals Swimming. It's super fun, as Yonka said, to swim with friends. Uh, and old is not what it used to be. Let's talk about that for a second. So this guy, I went to Cuba. I was very lucky to be able to go to Cuba in 2015. I was involved in a swim competition there, both open water and then there was a pool side of it too. The guy on the left is 101 years old. You know, the guy on the right is 85 years old. Um, say what you will about Cuba, but Fidel took really good care of his, of his athletes. And these guys are well, you know, well nutritioned, great athletes and, and swam and are swimming until the day they die. That's what swimming can do for older people. Um, I just wanted to say something about USMS. Uh, that's the master swimming here in the United States. And hi to everybody on this call from international. I heard there were some Australians, some from Iceland. Welcome to all of you. Uh, we have a master's program here called the United States Masters uh, Swimmers. And they used to have the highest um, age group that you could compete in was called 45 and above. That was in 1975 when USMS was created. You know, 10 years ago, the highest age group was 100 and above. And I will never forget the day that I, uh, I was swimming in Idaho. There was a 1.76 mile swim in Sandpoint, Idaho. One of the winners was a 96 year old man who won his age group. Now, granted, we have less competition as we get older. Let's face it, <laughs> the chances of us getting a medal is higher, so stick with it. And I, just my partner and I looked and said, geez, this guy is 96. And that was when it suddenly the light bulb went on for me that um, it's possible that older people are able to outperform uh, younger people because we're no longer muscling our way through. We now have the wisdom of age. Um, I think because swimming is so super technical, that's where um, maturity really helps. It helps us figure out how, can, and it's strategic. A lot of times the younger you are, you don't really realize how technical and strategic swimming is. So my message here is that maturity uh, can really help. That's a, um, a picture of a bunch of over 50 swim, swimmers a few years ago on Lake Washington here. 
So I'm, I'm really waiting to see, I'm really interested in seeing your comments and questions in chat. I know that Yanka can uh, respond to some of those and I'll be looking over there as well as I go along. And I'm super looking at the time as well. Uh, Yanka mentioned the cervical uh, spine. I want to do that as well, because if there's one thing that older swimmers deal with, it's stiffness. Uh, and what I've discovered is that uh, the cervical spine, this part right here, I think you can see my cursor, the thoracic piece of the spine, right here, the upper spine on older swimmers is the part that gets stiff. Uh, it's really important for all of us to retain mobility in the thoracic part of, our, part of our spine, which is that part right there in the middle. And I'm going to ask you to humor me and go along with me for a second. Now, you can take yourself off camera if you don't want to do this in front of other people, but I'd like us to do an exercise together that would show how to limber up this thoracic part of your spine. I'm gonna push myself away from my desk so that I can stick my arms out in front of me like this. And I'm gonna put my feet flat on the floor with my knees and ankles together. So don't let your knees separate on this and don't let your, uh, your feet come off the floor. Keep these hands together, facing forward, simply move to either side, the right or the left, as far as you can go. Now the goal, come back to center, is to go all the way, whoa, like 90 degrees over there and uh, keeping that thoracic uh, spine mobile during this. Um, you can, if you can only go over here, it's obvious that you might wanna continue doing this exercise and others that you can find online uh, to give more mobility to the thoracic part, um, the thoracic vertebra. Uh, in your spine. Just in chat, can you give me some uh, input on how that felt for you? Just tap it in there. How did moving that part of your spine feel for you? And I see that somebody did Galapagos, cool. Uh, vacations in Europe. I'm just waiting to see what people have to say about your own experiences with the thoracic spine. Surprisingly stiff. Yeah, beyond 45. Some could not get beyond 45 degrees. Yeah, um, Beth, I just want to climb onto that. If you're at your desk all day, it doesn't really matter how old you are. You need this exercise, right? Um, it just feels good to get that moving. And if you ever see older ladies with that dowager's hump, um, you know, it's that roundness. It's because they have allowed that thoracic spine to get a little less mobile. As swimmers, we can combat that and it just makes us healthier overall. I also see that uh, Leslie saying that one side was uh, easier than the other. That's typical for me as well, that one side is always a little bit easier. Uh, good. Here's uh, somebody who's working to be a Pilates instructor. Uh, saying that that's a good way to assess, well, how mobile is this person in that area? And Celia, good for you. 57 meters is nothing to scoff at this morning. Uh, congratulations. So last part of my spiel, and then I, I, I want to ask you some more that I'm going to ask you to put in chat, um, is all about what older swimmers are up to. What can we do? Well, I'm really excited right now because uh, here's another thing. Uh, that I've developed. It's the, and say this fast, silver seals of the Salish Sea. <laughs> say it fast, silver seals of the Salish Sea. That's us. It's a bunch of swimmers, only six of us over 60 years old. And we have an exciting plan uh, for this summer. Uh, this is what it is. We're going to swim. And let me put this uh, for you. I got to stretch it out a little bit. For you in other countries, uh, you won't know exactly where this is, but if you're in Washington state, you know exactly where this is. Bremerton is a huge Navy town. Uh, and we're gonna swim through Rich Passage as a relay. Um, it's a 10.4 mile swim over to the tip of Alki Beach. And that's on the far right. This is called the Amy Highland swim simply because Amy Highland was the first person that is known to have swum it. And I believe it was in the mid forties that she swam that. I might be wrong on that. If somebody can correct me in chat, if you know when Amy Highland swam the swim. 
Uh, the great thing for us is that our captain, you know, this is a sanctioned swim through NAUSA. You guys have VAUSA, we have NAUSA uh, in, in, um, in Seattle and the state of Washington. Uh, it's going to be a sanctioned swim um, observed, and each of our six swimmers will be swimming uh, just a half hour, um, and then uh, we'll probably swim another half hour to get through this passage. I was a little bit disappointed because I'm trying to fit this a little bit better. Uh, I wanted to swim through the rich passage, which is that part that right out of Bremerton. If you time it right, the current is ferociously with you. So you feel like you're flying, whew, just like a, a water slide almost. But we realized if we want to set a record, which we do, because uh, it's never been done, we're going to set a record anyway. It's never been done as a relay, and it's certainly never been done by older swimmers. We had to put the two lead swimmers, the faster swimmers, uh, and let them swim that part. So the rest of us, more slow swimmers, uh, could kind of uh, get through the rest of it. But we needed to get out of Rich's Passage, and that's why the faster swimmers took that part. So I'm going to leave this picture on, but I'm going to put a couple more things in. I just, just one other thing in chat before uh, I ask you a question. Uh, I think Patrick mentioned the Facebook page. I invite everyone who's over 60 or who loves someone over 60. There are tons of people who are not 60 or over on this page. But this page, I felt a great need for people to be able to brag. Uh, to brag about swimming 5,700 meters, for example, uh, to brag about a new stroke that they've learned. We have both open water and pool swimmers on the site, and it's totally international. We have people in Chile that are uh, on there occasionally, um, people from all over the world. It's not a huge site, but I invite you to uh, go to the site and join, or at least ask to join. It's a private um, site, and I'll let you in. And so, I guess what I want to ask you, and I'm going to ask you to put this in chat, is I told you about our goal, the silver seals of the Salish Sea. That's our exciting goal, the swim that Amy, High, Amy Highland swim. Everybody on this call, if you could put in chat, what is your goal this year? What is your goal for this season? And I especially want to hear if you are over 60. You don't have to say how old you are, and I invite everyone on the call to put in your goal. But I just want to see the amazing diversity of open water swimming goals that you're going to um, all be accomplishing now that COVID is slowing down and we're actually able to get into the lake. You know, Claire, I don't even know where Bunsen Lake is. You're challenging me to look on the map and find that out. You might see me up there one of these days. Um, cool, Philippe. 2,000 meters. Where are you going to swim that? Which body of water are you going to swim that in? 20,000 meters. So Philippe goes 2,000. Sylvie goes 20,000. Hey, what can I say? Doing the AK. Cool. And that's my friend Carol Horowitz. She's a Zog, as SD older, uh, older um, gal swimming. She's going to do a, one of our 8Ks with Say Yes to Life Swims. Yay, Glenda. Good. Yeah, look at these. I mean, when you realize what a powerful contingent of swimmers we are, uh, and it could be because we're all baby boomers. Wow. I mean, we're big. Um, and we've got a lot of power and a lot of, I just want to say passion going for us. Keep on eyeballing these. Um, oh, it looks like Chris and Jean might actually be able to meet up with Claire. And Michael, <laughs> does he, he wants to swim with us, the zesty older gal swimming. Michael, you are always invited. Wow. So let's put a few more in there. And then I'm going to make sure that I uh, have turned on the sound and optimized for the video clip. Because I'm going to share with you um, as a kind of a inspirational piece, a video a professionally made video about my friend Kirby, Kirby Dromba. When this video was made a few years ago, he was only 82. Now he's 84, 85. And he is a fantastic swimmer. Um, I'm going to ask people, if you haven't already, turn off your cameras. Just flick off your video. The reason for that is that it's difficult sometimes when there's a bunch of people on a call. It gets really out of sync. Uh, and if uh, you have problems, 
uh, after all, let me close this other one. Uh, let's say the sound gets muddled somehow. I'm also going to put the link in chat. But just sit back and enjoy, and we'll reconvene after uh, this video is over. And let me know if you can't hear it. Uh oh, it has to, of course, get going. Maybe because there are so many people on the call, it's not really even wanting to go. <laughs> If this doesn't work, we'll do some Q&A while I try to make it work. Yeah, I think we're going to have some problems with it breaking up because it's so big. Let me put the, uh, the link in chat, and you can look at this later on your own time. Uh, and I'm going to take that off share. I'm going to let it keep on going, and if it looks like it's going to work for us, I'll put us back on that. But for now, it looks like we have um, about eight more minutes for any number of questions or comments, both for Yanka and myself. Um, and I think that, uh, Patrick, you want people to remain muted, right? You just want them to put them in chat. Is that correct? Uh, unfortunately, yes, that is. Okay. But, but the beauty of that is everyone can uh, see the questions. Yeah, yeah. So what's coming up for you? Now you have a pocket full of ideas about how to get in and start your open water swimming career. Um, you also know how exciting it is right now in this day and age to be a, a, a swimmer over 60. And here's somebody who's gonna be working on an ice mile. So for you who don't know what an ice mile is, I know that Bowser put on a webinar a while ago about cold water swimming. An ice mile is a mile swim, in, and I'm gonna speak in Fahrenheit, Fahrenheit here, in 41 degree water or less. They have to complete the entire mile. Um, and I don't know that there's a time restriction, correct me if I'm wrong, but they have to complete the mile in order to have a sanctioned ice mile. So that's a huge, uh, a huge goal. I can swim in super cold water like in Sweden, but certainly not for a mile. I mean, that was a 50 meter uh, swim. And for one of the few times in my life, I podiumed because there was only two of us in that, in that heat. <laughs> okay. Um, and I'm going to address your question about earplugs. I, I really strongly recommend earplugs if you ever get vertigo or if you're ever dizzy in the open water, I, or if you're going to swim in cold water. As Patrick said earlier, I swim year round. Lake Washington in particular gets really cold uh, in the winter time. And I am addicted to my earplugs because I'm convinced they help keep my brain warm. You know how we're all kind of a little bit less functional than usual, to put it politely, after a cold water swim. I think earplugs help me retain a certain semblance of normalcy until I can warm up. They, they're not a cure-all, but if you're going to swim in cold water, it's a really good idea to wear earplugs. And I wear Max, the silicon kind that you just kind of tap in your ears. I hope that that helped you. Okay, so Jesse answered, yeah, the 1600 meters in 5C and below. And Gar, if you're comfortable wearing a nose plug, for me, it inhibits my exhalation. So, but I used to wear one because I hated getting water up my nose. So we, do what's comfortable for you. And Yanka, please jump in here. And if you see some of these that you want to um, answer or respond to, Please, uh, please do so. Yanka, do you want to uh, uh, speak to Sandy's issue? What do you eat while swimming? I hate swimming with food in my belly. <laughs> uh, so my suggestion with that is just have really, really small little bites and more often probably would be better than just filling your belly up with lots of food initially. So, you know, if you're going to have, a, let's say, a banana as one of the things that you're going to have, maybe have one or two bites and then go for a bit and then go come back and have one or two bites. So it is something then that can be processed uh, by your body without having this big, huge lump of stuff in there. But yeah, because sometimes that does, especially if the water is wavy, it can start to make you feel a little bit dizzy and maybe even a little nauseous. So keep the amount that you're swim eating 
in small manageable bites uh, more often would be my suggestion. Does anybody else have any experience with that? So what I do on a longer swim, for example, that 11 mile thing, thing I say, because I tell you, I've rarely been as uncomfortable with, uh, in a swim as I did because it was one of these really hot summers and it happened in Portland. Uh, when we got out, somebody measured the water it was 90 degrees. The water at the shallowest part was 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, it was so super warm, I should say hot, through the entire swim that it was really uncomfortable. And I did not wear a wetsuit, of course. It would have been unallowed anyway. Um, I don't really know how, oh, but how I ate on that uh, was I, um, I had a kayaker and I had made uh, some little packets, you know, baby food, little packets. I had put some starch and um, oatmeal kind of combination. And it allowed me just to squeeze this stuff and then throw the pack back to him. Um, and I did, I did feed every, I think I probably did every 50 minutes, 50, 55 minutes on such a long swim um, and definitely drank a lot of water uh, as I went along. Um, any other questions? I do see we're coming up. We got about three more minutes. Any other questions? Is there any other? And I'm just going to bring your attention back. I keep trying to get the video. I think because there's so many people on the call, we can't do it. Uh, I invite you to take that link. You have to kind of scroll up on your chat now. And I think Vows is going to get it out to you as well. And enjoy that five-minute video about Kirby um, and his adventures in open water swimming as an 82-year-old uh, swimmer. So, you know, with that, I think I'd like to hand it back to Patrick to all right. pull this all together. Well, thank that. That was wonderful. And uh, again, uh, I'm so glad that this is being recorded, and and we'll try to put that video on, uh, make it available as well. Because I, I've seen it, and it's priceless. I mean, it's very inspiring, uh, and it's so nice to know that uh, even though uh, many of us are well over, uh, get are over sixty, we can go to a hundred. There's nothing to stop it. So, and it's such a great exercise, and it's not going to hurt your joints. Um, and in fact, it's going to keep us going. Yeah. All right. Well, listen, thank you both. Two excellent uh, presentations. Uh, very, very worthwhile. Um, and now to wrap things up, we're going to have a few closing comments from Vows of President, Craig Stewart. Um, you're, you're going to be stuck with me, Christine, oh. the Vows of Vice President. Sorry for the last minute swap out. Um, but thank you all for attending this session, um, especially on such a warm evening. Hopefully you have air conditioning or you're cool. Um, that was such a great session. Um, I'm not 60, but I still really appreciated all that information that you both shared with us. And uh, Gia, these adventure swims you're doing are so exciting. I like, so exciting. Um, as Craig mentioned, VAUSA creates safe and enjoyable open water swim experiences for people of all ages. Uh, the VAUSA practice swims are a great opportunity for new and experienced swimmers to meet like-minded people and to swim in a large group. We feel that there's safety in numbers and comfort and confidence in numbers. When there's, you know, 50 to 100 people getting in the water, you don't feel like you're alone. It helps to be out there and, uh, if you come out and join us, uh, we're a diverse group. There's swimmers, wetsuit swimmers, non-wetsuit swimmers, marathon swimmers, triathletes. Uh, you're likely to find someone that you can want to swim with. And I've met many of my great friends through Valsa. So I just want to encourage anyone that's interested that hasn't come out to come out and see what we're all about. And hopefully, um, it's like Gia said, it's super fun to swim with friends. Thank you all again for coming. Thank you, Christine. And thank you everybody for joining us. Okay, that's it. That's, uh, that's a wrap.